the issue of money and the issue of possessions and of course the issue of how we steward our time in the pursuit of, of, of all of that stuff is, is an issue of the heart. That, that is exactly why Jesus talked about it. It is the preeminent window into the state of the heart. This has nothing to do with getting into heaven, but everything to do with quality of heaven. So the working premise here is that God gives us everything that we have, but to invest in kingdom purposes, and in so doing, we invest in our own eternal state. And that is a holy and a righteous motive. Well, open your Bibles into Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, it has been not just a number of weeks, but actually a number of months uh, since we've been in the Gospel of Luke together. Uh, and so I am grateful to be back in the, the saddle again, so to speak, uh, and to be able to set our thoughts uh, on this wonderful account of the life and the ministry of our Lord. If you are uh, newer with us, we've been making our way through this gospel chapter by chapter and verse by verse for almost six years at this point, and so we are currently in chapter 16. Now, you'll have to think back to about the middle of March uh, to a time that was before Easter, and uh, we were in chapter 16. We had actually just begun this chapter, and we looked at this parable in verses 1 through 9 of the unrighteous steward. In fact, as we saw, chapter 16 uh, is actually a chapter that is entirely devoted to the critical issue of the Christian and their money, the issue of your wealth, your possessions, and therefore, most importantly, your decision-making. In fact, notice verse 1 in Luke chapter 16. He begins with the parable involving a rich man, a manager, and this rich man's possessions. That is what we looked at last time. Then in verse 14, notice Luke reports that the Pharisees were there and they were, as he says, lovers of money and were therefore listening and scoffing at his message. And then in verse 19, Jesus tells another parable about a rich man who is dressed in purple, which again is a sign of wealth and royalty in this culture, who is joyously living in splendor every day, Jesus says. And so again, this is a chapter about money unambiguously. It's about possessions. It's about wealth. This is about stewardship. This is about how you view your life, how you view your time, how you view every resource that comes into your life, how you view even all of your pursuits. And so in that sense, this is actually a chapter that goes far beyond just the issue simply of money. That's just the surface issue. In fact, this comes again to be a chapter about stewarding all of life, and all of life does not actually belong to us. It is a gift. And of course, stewarding it well, but for the sake of Christ and the cause of his kingdom. And so this is in many ways a challenging chapter. And because this is one of those chapters that forces us to analyze and to reflect in a necessary and needed way, but even in a painful way at times as to the state of our own hearts, it is one of those chapters that does that very effective work of laying open bare the state of our hearts before us. In fact, as many of you know well, Jesus talked more about the issue of money than almost any other issue. And so as we've been seeing, even in Luke, that is not because Jesus was always trying to guilt people. He certainly was not interested in just getting people to crack open their wallets. Rather, because the issue of money and the issue of possessions, and of course the issue of how we steward our time in the pursuit of, of, of all of that stuff is, is an issue of the heart. That, that is exactly why Jesus talked about it. It is the preeminent window into the state of the heart. And so this is a chapter that comes to be about motive. This is about what drives us. This is about what shapes us. This is about what controls us and compels us. What is it that controls our decisions? What is it that informs our pursuits? And because the truth is, is that what you choose to do with your life or what you choose not to do with your life tells on the heart, tattles on you. In fact, Jesus had this habit of, of saying over and over again in a matter of words that, that talk is, is cheap, right? Incredibly cheap. It is an unreliable indicator as to the state of, of where a, a person actually stands, and I can just tell you that as a pastor. And so Jesus was not all that interested 
in lip service. He was not very impressed at all by what a person would say, but instead he was always interested in what is it that the life is actually producing. That is the question. And because what your life produces, and I have said this probably no less than a hundred times from this pulpit, but it bears repeating constantly because some people get it and then others of us need to be reminded of it. But what your life produces is, without question, the test of the heart. That is always the test. And because your life, now hear this, but your life is always revealing not just what you're believing, but what you're loving what you're loving. And so it does not actually matter what a person says. Does it matter what a person professes? Does it matter what a person is able to talk about? It doesn't matter what a person is able to argue over. What matters is do they have a life that matches the mouth? If I could be blunt for a moment. In fact, this was the very teaching of Jesus himself very clearly in Luke chapter 9 in verses 57 through 62, when he was talking to all of those would-be followers, those would-be disciples, we don't have the time to look at the passage, but there Jesus had a massive following. And all the people there were saying with their mouth that they wanted to follow him. I will follow you, Lord, wherever you go, right? This was the consistent profession. And so what does Jesus do? Well, he, he immediately looks at them and, and does what Jesus does. And that is, he says, okay, I, I hear the profession. I, I hear what you're saying. So let's test it. Let's test the profession. Let, let's test the mere words that you speak. And because I'm not interested in what you say, I'm interested in what you do. And because what you do reveals what you're loving from the heart, and I'm all about the heart. And so I'm not interested in words, I'm interested in faithful obedience. To put it into a word, to use the language of that text, I'm interested in you following me. Being an actual follower, not just a mere professor, And so let me just begin here by saying this morning, and for those of you who might be thinking already, yeah, we know this. You, you just keep talking about this. We've heard this many times. We get it. We know the principles. My, my humble request of you is that over the next several weeks that you not take this chapter lightly, but instead begin that critical work of allowing the words of Jesus to actually penetrate into your heart and wash over your life so that you might begin to examine what it is that you might actually be loving or loving still too much. And I realize that this stuff is so easy to just shrug off at times because, again, we get it. We get this. And it's so easy to become passive about what Jesus is constantly trying to drive into the heart. But, again, this is about far more than money. That is not the issue. There is a reason he keeps returning to this topic. Money is just that low-hanging fruit that functions, functions as an able assistant to help us better see our hearts. And so again, I say to you, this is not about money. This is about the heart. And because the heart is the very thing that controls what we do with our money. And why money, therefore, is such a reliable tattler on the heart and therefore so helpful in discerning what it is that we actually love and what we worship. And so with that as just a way to get us back into the message of chapter 16, let's take a look at the actual text for this morning. And I'm going to begin here by just reading the verses for us. And we're going to be specifically in verses 10 through 13 of chapter 16. So let me just read these, and then we'll take a closer look at what Jesus is teaching. And so beginning here in verse 10, here's what Jesus says. Notice, he says, now he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. 
So therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, which again is just a reference to money, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give to you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. But you cannot serve God and wealth. Again, You'll have to try to think back to many weeks ago, but remember, this is actually connected to verses 1 through 9, where Jesus told that parable again of the unrighteous steward, which is what we looked at last time. And so verses 10 through 13 now are actually built off of that parable, and what Jesus is doing is he's now giving further explanation or motive or practical application to the meaning of the parable. And so let me just quickly try and remind us a little bit about the parable that we looked at in more detail last time. And so first of all, remember that this is a story of of a manager. He's been put in charge of a a very great operation. He's been put in charge of an enormous amount of assets. Uh, He is the manager of another man's rather expansive operation. And so the manager here, who's actually pretty skilled, he was a clever man, as we saw. He is put in charge of a particular operation of this owner. Uh, But then he gets busted for squandering the resources and all of the assets under his management. In fact, the term there for squander, as we saw, it was the same term used to speak of uh, what it is that the prodigal son did in the previous parable when he squandered all of his possessions. And so uh, it comes to be the idea of the fact that he was wasteful. This manager was, was a squander. He was wasteful. In fact, it was so appalling that the man who told on him reported that this manager was actually devilish. In fact, remember the term there was was diabolo, from which we get the term diabolical, Uh, and so he had a devilish motive. And it's not, remember, that he was doing anything necessarily illegal, it's just that he was reckless. He was entrusted with a great responsibility, but he absolutely wasted it. Uh, And so it's a term that comes to speak actually of the man's character, but as a result of what was abiding within his own heart. In fact, what we saw was that he was actually beginning to view the money or the resources as if they were actually his. That was the issue. That is to say, he was a man who had forgotten his stewardship. He had forgotten that his task was to take that which actually belonged to another and then use it all or employ it all for the purpose of maximal gain or return to the owner. And so what we saw was that this was an analogy for how many will begin to view the stewardship of their own life, but before God. People can easily begin to view their money, their resources, their their gifts, their skills, their talents, perhaps most importantly, even their time as somehow actually belonging to them. And so in the setting up of of the parable this way, Jesus is already introducing a very significant principle, and that is that nothing that we possess is actually ours. It is not ours. That was the point. Rather, everything is but a stewardship, and it is therefore to be stewarded well. We have been entrusted. We we have been given the oversight of our, our lives, so to speak, but for the purpose of providing back to the owner maximal gain. Fruit. And so in the flow of of the parable, again, the manager gets caught. The owner comes back. He he busts him because, again, somebody tells on him. And then the owner tells the manager that he's got a little bit of time to get the books together. Get the books together. Come and give to me an account. And because after which, you're gone. Now, the owner, as we saw, made a very dramatic misstep. This is just poor business practice. You should have gotten rid of this guy immediately. You don't tell somebody they're fired, give them a little bit more of a task to do, uh, and then try and give them the boot. That's going to create for you many, many problems. And so in giving to this manager some, some time to compile a report, what does the manager do? Well, he gets clever. He does what this manager does. And so what does he do? Well, he desi- decides to employ the owner's resources yet again, but for his own purposes. And so in verses three through seven, he goes off to each of the owner's debtors. And what does he do to them? Well, he gives to them a very steep discount on their loans. And why? Well, for the purpose of currying 
from them their favor. And why does he want their favor? Well, so that once he actually gets terminated, he'll then have some options to get hired. And, and so, of course, we looked at how he did that in some detail last time. It was very, very clever. But the bottom line is that he used the owner's resources to gain for himself um, an advantage. That, that was the point. Um, and so the owner in this parable was outplayed. He was outmaneuvered. And so what happens in verse 8? Well, the owner comes back to the manager, and then in a very shocking statement, he actually praises this manager for his, his manipulation. And he praises him not because he's happy about the loss that, that he's incurred, or not because it was necessarily ethical at all, but because he recognized the cleverness of this man's actions. And so notice in verse 8, he praises him, but for his shrewdness, his wisdom, his, his ability to accomplish what he desired to accomplish for himself. He was a clever man. In fact, uh, the owner was probably reminded as to why he hired him in the first place. This man has got some skills. Now, again, he obviously wasn't very ethical, but he was nevertheless strategic, incredibly strategic. And, and so what is the point of the parable? Well, the point was simply to say, so if people of this world are so skilled at employing strategy like this to get themselves ahead, uh, just in this fleeting, temporary life, and they do it by leveraging the resources of another, then why aren't the sons of light, verse 8, but why aren't the sons of light doing the same when it comes to matters of eternity? That is to say, why don't you use the gifts and the resources that God has entrusted to you and then employ them through clever strategy for the purpose of setting yourself up for some eternal reward? Verse 9. And we talked about the meaning of verse 9 more specifically last time, so you'll have to go back and catch it if, if you want to understand what's actually being said there. But the basic idea, again, is that everything that you have and everything that's been given to you is not actually yours to be squandered for how you desire to squander it. Rather, all of it is the resources of another, namely God himself, and all of which then has been, has been entrusted to you, but for the purpose of gospel ministry, for the cause of advancing the kingdom, the cause of advancing God's purposes, God's operations. And what is so perspective-shaping, I think, about verse 9 is that, is that everything you use then for kingdom purposes now is actually a direct investment, Jesus says, into your own future eternal reward. And the best part about it is that since everything that you have is God's anyways, what is God actually doing? Well, he's simply resourcing to you the initial capital for your own future investment. And what is, what is the point then? Well, that either you will make a decision to squander everything on yourself right now, which of course you can do, and then with nothing to show for it, or you'll invest it into the kingdom, but so that you might receive back multiple fold in the age to come. In other words, everything that you use, choose to keep is what you'll ultimately lose, but anything that you choose to give away now for the purposes of the kingdom is what you'll ultimately keep. That was the principle. And so in light of that parable, then, we come now to verses 10 through 13, in which Jesus takes that concept and now expands upon it. And let me just say here that this phrase in verse 8, notice, of, of the sons of light is critical to observe. I didn't talk too much about it last time. But who are the sons of light? Well, the sons of light, again, are simply true believers, Sons of light was a Jewish idiom that was used to describe those who knew the truth. Uh, to be in the light in the scriptures is to be one who dwells in the truth. In other words, it is to say that you know better. And so what Jesus is, is saying here is, oh, and, and by the way, every single one of you know this, and why? Well, presumably because you're a Christian. And so what then is this teaching? What will this isn't a teaching actually for those who aren't Christians or teaching a principle for how to get into the kingdom or how to get, quote, saved. Rather, this is a teaching for those who already are. And so, as I mentioned last time, we are not the Catholic Church. Your entrance into heaven has absolutely nothing to do with what you can do for God, but everything that God has done for you in Christ. And so we don't gain heaven by giving to the church. Rather, we gain heaven by simply trusting 
and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. And so what then is this teaching? Well, this is a teaching then on how to think about your life and how to think about your time and how to think about your money and your skills and your resources, but as a Christian. This is for the Christian. This is for the one who knows that everything they have and everything they are is nothing but a gift of God. And that all of it has simply been entrusted to us by the creator himself, but to see as to what in the world we're actually going to do with it. And why? Well, because again, anything that God wants to do or to get done, he doesn't actually need us, right? He doesn't need you. He doesn't need your stuff. Why? Because it's his. And God will accomplish his good pleasure anyway. Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things things which have not yet been done, saying, my purposes will be established and I will, hear the intent of that statement, but I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Translation, God doesn't need us. He doesn't need our money. He doesn't need our help for anything. Rather, he is the sovereign God of the universe who owns and orchestrates everything so that his purposes will always come to pass. Every single time. And yet in his mercy, wonder of wonders, he has chosen to use us. And so what he does is he equips us with time, and talents, and gifts, and resources to strategically employ for the kingdom. And the best part about all of it is that it's a direct investment into our own eternity. In other words, it's actually a pure motive. Now hear this. It is a pure motive to do all that you do so that you might maximize your heavenly reward. That is a pure motive. That is the very motive that Jesus himself gives time and time again. And so you're already a son of light if you're in Christ. And so if the wicked are willing to strategize for everything in this world that fades, then why aren't we also willing to do the same for that which doesn't? Verse 8. And so in light of that concept, he now expands here in verses 10 through 13. So for those of you who like structure, let me just give you some quick points. So in verse 10, he gives just the simple principle. Verse 10 is the principle. In 11 through 12, he gives some considerations. 11 through 12, he gives some considerations, and then he ends it in verse 13 with what I'm just going to call the point. Verse 13 is the point that is where everything is driving. So verse 10, the principle, 11 through 12, some considerations, and then in verse 13, we'll see the point of it all. And so let's take a look, first of all, here at the principle. And in coming off of the parable again in 1 through 9, he then immediately says this. So notice again, if you would, what he says. He says, so he who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Now, here we have the very basic principle that is true in any area of life, but certainly true in ministry, certainly true in the Christian life, and that is that what you do when you have a little and and things are tight and and things are difficult and inflation hits and maybe you're just given a little pay raise, but whatever you do when you have little, hear this, that is exactly then what you will do when you have much. Needs almost no explanation. And why? Why is that the case? Well, because again, this has everything to do with what you love and what you're trusting in and what you're actually believing to be true about the God whom you serve. And so as I mentioned last time, this has very little to do with how much you have or maybe everything that you don't have. Rather, this has everything to do with what you do with what you have. The amount is irrelevant. This is a character issue. This is a trust issue. This is an issue of the heart. This is an issue of of what you're believing. This is an issue actually of what you're loving or more to the point in the context. This is an issue of what you still might be loving too much. And so in verse 10, we have the basic principle. He says, if you're faithful with a little, you will be faithful with much. Fact, this is just true. And if you're unrighteous with little, then fact, notice, you will you will also be unrighteous or unfaithful with much. 
And so let me just say on this, and because this is the point of Jesus, and this is the very issue that he, he's getting at, but the reason for the statement is because every single one of us, and we know it in our own hearts, we are absolute masters of rationalization, aren't we? That is what we are. And almost everybody who is a genuine Christian with the Spirit of God in them is, is thinking what? Well, they're thinking that they, they, they want to honor Christ. They want to honor him. If, you, if you're a Christian here this morning, at the end of the day, that, that's, that's your heartbeat. And the more that you grow in Christ, the more that your desire to honor him grows as well. And if you're a Christian, not a Christian here this morning, you don't understand that at all. That is such a foreign, strange concept to you. But I doubt that there's almost anybody here this morning, if you're genuinely in Christ, that doesn't actually want to pour into the kingdom. You want to be used by God. You want to see the kingdom grow. You want to see people come to Christ. You want to see this church grow. You want to see ministry happen. You want to see the name of, of Christ be heralded as Lord, that this is what you want. If you're in Christ, your heart is being transformed little by little by the Spirit of God to begin to desire that which God desires. And yet, what is the problem? Well, the problem is that every single one of us are still absolute masters of rationalization. And so what we'll do is we'll say, yeah, I want to see this happen. I want to invest in eternity, but it's just that if I can accomplish this other thing first, whatever this, this other thing is, if I could just get the raise, if I could just get the bonus, I'm still a student, I just bought a house, I've got a medical bill, and so if I could just graduate or if I could just get the job or if I could just get the promotion, if I could just pay this off, again, whatever, whatever it might be. But we say that if I can just accomplish this first, then I'll be more strategically positioned to honor Christ and contribute in a better way. I'll be more fully devoted. But what is Jesus' immediate response? Verse 10. No, you won't. He says, no, you won't. And because again, notice, it is not an issue of how much or little you have, but this is an issue of what you do with what you have. And so if you're not doing it now when you have little, whether it's a little money or a little time or a little talent, then trust me, you're not going to do it when you have much. And if you want to know the proof of that, so let me just try and press this happy topic into your hearts this morning. And again, I have no secret knowledge, so I feel the need to qualify that. I keep myself out of the finances, actually, for the most part around here. But just ask yourself this question. When you get a raise, or you hear that a raise is coming, what is your immediate thought? What do you think? For some of you, I'm willing to guess that it's not an excitement for all that this might mean for the kingdom, but it's an immediate thought as to what this might mean in terms of your next purchase. What's the next upgrade going to be? What's the next toy going to be? Or for some of you, and because you're driven by fear, your mind never goes to what you're going to get next necessarily. Rather, for you, your mind goes immediately to how much more cushion this is going to mean for you in your savings account. And because your great idol is comfort and security and money rather than simply trusting in the promises of God. And then as you actually receive the raise, so here's another question, and I'm just going to ask a lot of questions this morning because my job is to just get us to think. But when you actually receive the raise, does it then evidence itself proportionately in something like your giving? So for Paul, for example, commands this actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verses 1 through 2. Here, what he, listen to what he says. But he says this, for example, now concerning collections, which the collections there is a collections for the sake of gospel ministry, but concerning the collections for the saints, as I directed the churches in Galatia, so I do you also. So this is a command. Now listen, on the first day of every week, so this is first fruits stuff, 
Where again, remember, first fruits was that Old Testament principle that you were to give to God out of the first of your fruits, not out of your surplus. God had promised if you give out of the first of the fruits, then I'll guarantee that you'll have what you need. But if you give out of your surplus, then the promise goes away. And why? Well, because it's, it's, it's the issue of trust and a promise of God to provide for them. And so they were not to give from their safety or surplus, but from the first of their fruits. So Paul picks up on that concept and says, so on the first day of every week, each one of you is, so command, but each one of you is to put aside and say for the purpose of the collection and then key phrase, and as he may prosper. As he may prosper. So he says that you are to give, but you are to give in proportion to your prosperity. And why? Well, because God is the one who allows a person to prosper in the first place. In other words, let me ask it this way. When you get an increase in revenue, does everything just say the same for you? Or does it actually evidence itself in what you give? Just a simple question to consider, which... By the way, is why I also say that it is perfectly reasonable then actually to pull back than when you have a decrease in revenue. In terms of, I say give in terms of percentage instead of a number when you feel like you haven't given in a while because you are to give in terms of your prosperity in proportion to your prosperity. And so percentage-based approach becomes very helpful and because the times, as we all know, fluctuate, but again, I have a whole sermon on the practicality of giving and what that might look like in a real way in a previous sermon, so that is not the point for this morning. But does a trust in God evidence itself in proportion to how he prospers you? That is the question. And do you say, well, you know, you're starting to sound like one of those pastors. It's all about money, the three Bs, buildings, budgets, and butts. Well, as I said, first of all, God doesn't actually need our money to accomplish anything. He already owns the cattle of a thousand hills, as the psalmist says, and so everything that is is his anyways, and so if he wants to get something done, he doesn't need us. But as we've also seen, God loves what? He loves a cheerful giver, right? And so if you just give out a begrudging submission or because it feels like religious duty to you, then as I said many, many times, then just keep it. Just keep it. And why? Well, because then it's then actually doing nothing for you in terms of eternity, and so you might as well just spend it on your pleasures in the here and the now. But the point of Jesus is to say, if we can understand this, is that in God's mercy, he allows us to play a part in what he's doing, and that depending upon the hard attitude and the joy of, of the service, it has direct correlation then as to what gets put into your eternal pocket. And so Jesus says, look, if you don't do it now when you have little, then you're not going to do it when you have much. And why? Well, because this has everything to do with where your treasure is and what you're hoping in. This is not about quantity. This is about character. This is not about a number. This is about the heart and where your joy is and where your hope is and where you put your trust. And, and let me just say here as well that, that many of you in this church are unbelievably faithful you are, and you do what you do because you love Christ, you want to honor him, I know that. But let me just hasten to add that while others of you are, are perhaps faithful to give, you give, but only because you're driven by guilt. But conviction and guilt are not the same thing. And, and what is the difference between conviction and guilt? Well, a person who does what they do by guilt is a person driven by a sense of needing to atone for, for sin in some way, legalism, trying to rid the, the guilt of their sin or, or calm that religious sense in them somehow through giving. Let me do this to offset the depravity in, in my life or let me do something because it makes me feel like a better person. It's just religionism. But a person who gives by conviction is a person who does what they do because they know how much they've already been wonderfully forgiven. And so they do it as an offering of worship that flows from a desire to see the kingdom of God spread in the name of Christ to be heralded. And so they're controlled by the truth of the scriptures. 
And so if you give because it's a way to appease the guilt, then again, I say to you, just keep it. Because God honors only those who do what they do by a conviction in the word of God that flows from a heart of love and trust. And so we can understand the nature of, of the promise of what Jesus is saying, that it actually begins to change our perspective. In fact, turn quickly to Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19. This is such a key text. We saw it last time, but it bears repeating just very briefly again. But Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19, Jesus here is teaching on fear and worry and anxiety and how much of that is related to a distrust and God's ability to supply for every single need as a true child of his. And so again, these are promises for the true children of God. God is under no obligation to care for those who aren't his, but he has given wonderful promises to those who are his. And so Jesus says these familiar words in verse 19, notice he says, and do not store up for yourselves, key word in this text, But do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth or rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. So there's the put off. What then is the put on? Verse 20, but stored up for yourselves. So notice again, key word, not God, but actually for yourself. So again, he's interested here in you. He's interested in your own eternal reward. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in or steal. So again, what is the motive that Jesus himself gives? Well, the motive is your own eternal reward. But if you're unfaithful in little, then you'll be unfaithful in much. And if you're unfaithful in little, then it's because you have a trust issue or a competing love issue. And again, remember in Luke chapter 16, he he is again talking here to sons of light, not sons of darkness. And so again, this has nothing to do with getting into heaven, but everything to do with quality of heaven. And so the working premise here is that God gives us everything that we have, but to invest in kingdom purposes, and in so doing, we invest in our own eternal state. And that is a holy and a righteous motive. The desire to see the kingdom of God expand and the desire for your own future eternal reward are not at odds. Two things can be true at once. And so if that is the working premise, here's the question. Who then is God going to entrust the heavenly riches to? This is where Jesus takes it back in Luke chapter 16. So so who's he going to entrust the riches of heaven to? Answer, the one who's been faithful with little in the here and the now. Because no matter how rich you are in this life, it is still little in terms of what is to come. And so he's given us a little bit of opportunity, but to see what we're going to do with it. He's entrusted to us a stewardship now to see how faithful we are. This is the principle. And so he who's faithful with little will be faithful with much. Notice then the considerations of verses 11 through 12. So here then are the considerations. Jesus says, so therefore, so in light of that premise... But therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, which again is a reference to money, but if you've not been faithful, keyword, faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth or the stuff that I've given to you to see what you're going to do with it, then who will entrust the true riches to you? Where the use of the definite article here of the means that this is a reference to, to the treasures or the riches in the age to come. And so again, this is, this is future-oriented. That is to say that faithfulness in anything in the Christian life is always the result of getting, but then maintaining an eternal perspective. Verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, uh, meaning again, God's resources that he's given to us now, who will give to you that which is your own, which is a reference to that eternal reward where it will finally actually be yours, not just on loan to you, but actually yours. And again, because it doesn't belong to this passing age where everything that we have is utterly going away, either by robbers or rust, or if not by them, then by the ultimate thief, which is death itself. And so notice the contrast then between the unrighteous wealth and the true riches in verse 11. He's saying here that if you're not faithful with the money and the skills and the time and the resources that I've allowed you to employ for this fleeting life, 
then why do you believe that you'll be entrusted with the true riches? Why would I give you the stuff of heaven if you've not been faithful with the stuff of earth? And so again, I say to you, this is about reward. This is about the opportunities and the responsibilities and even the riches that you'll be granted in eternity. In fact, the reality is that while all of us will equally be in heaven if we're in Christ and we'll all be in that same sinless eternal perfection, the reality is that we will not all be equal in heaven. This is just a biblical New Testament truth. There are varying degrees of reward. And so in a sense, it's, it's going to be back to Eden, but, but better. In fact, when God made the heavens and the earth, remember, he declared that it was good. He said, indeed, it's very good. But what he didn't declare is that it was perfect, which is how the fall, by the way, was able to happen. But the new heavens and the new earth will be perfect. That much is clear. And so in a sense, it'll be back to Eden, but in a perfect kind of way where we will actually be working in the new heavens and the new earth. And we'll have a certain level of responsibility. We'll have, we'll have stewardship just like Adam did in the garden. We'll have riches. We'll have varying degrees of responsibilities of things that we're to accomplish. In fact, we'll have the responsibility even to judge Paul says in Colossians, and apparently there, we're going to be judging angels, whatever that means. But the point to understand is that not all of us are going to be doing it equally. And so just as varying gifts and opportunities and responsibilities have been entrusted to us in this world, in the providence of God, it's all going to be, it's going to be very similar to that in, in the new earth. We're all equally Christians, but we're not all equal as Christians. We have varying assets that we've been entrusted with. And again, we're not talking about salvation, but rather responsibility and, and reward. That, that is so key. Do not hear what I'm not saying. This is not how you get into heaven. This has everything to do with the quality of heaven. And so Jesus says we are to store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And again, how do you do that? Well, you do it by maintaining an eternal perspective that is motivated by the honor of Christ. It's accomplished by viewing everything that you have, everything that you are, is not actually yours, but is just on loan to you as the creature. And so Jesus says this has everything to do with faithfulness. And again, I say to you that there is a sense in which you can have your reward now, no question about it, but if you spend it on self now, then you will not have it in eternity. And so Jesus says, first of all, be faithful in the small things. Be generous. Be your life, your money, your wealth, your possessions, your, your time, your skills, your giftings as on loan to you for the purpose of, of the kingdom. Employ it for the sake of ministry. Employ it for the sake of gospel expansion. And because we're just stewards, nothing more. And so he gives us here a motive to consider. And then third, verse 13, notice the point. Here's the point. So here's where it all drives, and here's where it's been driving, actually, since verse 1. Here's the point. Jesus says, and no servant can serve two masters. Why? For this reason, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. And then the absolute statement, you cannot serve God and wealth. What is this? This is a statement now about loves. This is about loyalty. This is about allegiance. In fact, if I had to simmer verse 13 down into a single command, it would simply be this. It would be, so be skeptical of yourself. In fact, what a tremendous spiritual discipline that is that most people never learn. Learn the discipline of becoming untrusting of what you think it is that you're actually loving. And is that to say, so just be, live in a morbid state of introspective guilt and, and suspicion? Well, maybe. Maybe. For some of you, maybe, and because the heart is unbelievably deceitful, the prophet says, and who can know it, right? And he doesn't say there the heart is unknowable. He says the heart is deceitful. It deceives you. That is to say, it does to you what the serpent did to Eve. And so it is a worthy spiritual discipline to be skeptical of your own heart, 
This age will tell you to love yourself, believe in yourself, trust yourself. No. Be skeptical of yourself. And so Jesus gives a teaching here to cause us yet again to perform a self-analysis. Take inventory of your life, he says. Take inventory of your decision, he says. Take inventory of your motives, he says. Why do you do what you do, and why do you not do what you don't do? And because behind every single decision of life is a motive. In fact, let me just say here that neutrality is a myth. It is a myth. No such thing. There's always a motive. There's always a desire. There's always what the Bible calls a epithumia. That means nothing to you. But it's a term in reference to, to cravings, to passion, to a driving motive and a desire to a certain hunger of of the heart. And it could be a holy craving or it could be a sinful one, but the point is that there is nevertheless always a craving. There's always a driving passion. And so what is he saying in verse 13? Well, he is saying that you can't ride two horses at the same time. It's just gonna go bad for you. That's why Christians live so often in what feels like a schizophrenic guilt. They have their legs straddled over the far sides of two horses, and when they start pulling apart, bad things happen. And so the idea here, then, is is one of competing loves. And what is the point? The point is that one love, here, this one love is bound to triumph. Notice what he says, you will hate one and love the other. That is, again, to say there is no middle ground. Absolute, black and white, clear cut, zero neutrality. And so here's the question, and and here's, here's the point, here's what Jesus is driving at. And it's the same question that he keeps returning to time and time again. And Luke, here's the question, what is it right now that you're living for? Why do you exist? What are you living for? Let me ask it this way. What do you spend your free time thinking about? Let me ask it this way, in light of the parable. What do you spend the bulk of your time strategizing for? And because chances are many of you in this room have got a plan We always got plans, right? And your approach to justify it perhaps is, is, yeah, but what's wrong with it? What's wrong with it? Well, again, that's not the question to ask. Wrong question. The question is, what is right about it? What's virtuous about it? put it in the category of a Christian, what's kingdom-oriented about it? What about it will maximize your mission and your fruitfulness for the cause of Christ? Or are you just floating? How will it strategically position you to maximally be useful for his purposes. For example, in this city of 1.5 million people who do not yet know Christ. When it comes to your free time and your skills and your pay raises and your hoped for pursuits, what is your immediate thought? Let me ask it this way. When other people think about you, what is it that defines you? What are you known for? What is your identity? Let me ask it this way. Again, just trying to throw out a bunch of questions to get you to think. But when people think about you and they think about your life and your face comes into their head, what do people see you as most sacrificing for? That's always the question, right? And because what you most love is absolutely what you most sacrifice for.
And depending upon how you answer those questions, you'll have the answer as to who it is or maybe what it is that is your master functionally. Now again, my, my goal here is not to guilt you. And because if I guilt you, you're gonna rationalize it away by lunch and you'll forget about it by dinner. And so my goal is to convict you by the power of the Spirit based upon the truth of what Jesus is saying here in his, his own word and to get you to analyze your life and to see if you can discern the true motive of your own heart and because it is a wise person who is skeptical of themselves. And let me just say that money makes people do all kinds of things that they never thought that they were capable of. When money comes into the picture, either, either when a person gets it or what a person is willing to do in order to get it or maybe even what a person does when they don't get it, will all kinds of stuff come out of that person that they never thought they were capable of. And you will see them no more skilled at self justification than in that moment. Why? Because it's an issue of the heart. And when you're dealing with matters of the heart, you're dealing with loves, and loves are absolutely blinding. They blind us. Wise people become fools when it comes to the heart. Some people love security, and they live in fear-ridden anxiety when it comes to thinking about money. Other people love pleasure and a certain standard of living, and so they live in a perpetual state of discontentment and utter waste. And because it's all about the here and the now and a certain lifestyle, and so they need more so that they can spend more, but then as they spend more, they need to figure out how to get more because until they have a certain amount of cushion in the account, their anxiety just keeps increasing. but none of that's biblical, none of that'll last, none of it honors Christ, and Christ won't honor it. And so what is the task? Well, the task then, is, as we've seen a number of times already, but the task then is to always get an eternal perspective. To get a conviction that your life is not your own, that you have been bought with a price, and you are to therefore glorify God with your life. In fact, again, this is for the Christian. Many of you know these things. I've taught on this a number of times. And so the goal here, again, is not to give you a theology of how to handle your possessions and give you the kind of how-tos on, on money. Rather, this is simply to function as a reminder in the providence of God as we come to this text this morning to once again analyze your life, analyze your decisions, analyze your motives, but to figure out what it is that is competing right now possibly for your love and all of your affections. And because at the end of the day, this is about worship. This is not about money. And it's just a, a practical, an aside here, and, and many of you know this, but I have to tell you that I've just never seen a person who is constantly thinking about money to be a joyful person. In fact, in robbing from God, to quote Malachi, they actually rob from themselves the gift of joy which is actually a gift that God inserts into a person. And so they live a life of fear, ridden, fretful discontentment. In fact, I read for you again Proverbs 23 and verse 4, which I read for you last time. But Proverbs 23 and verse 4, the writer says this. He says, now listen, do not weary yourself to gain wealth. How many of you are so tired? Just exhausted from running on that hamster wheel that's yielded you nothing. Just for some kid of yours to squander it away when they inherit it anyway. But do not weary yourself to gain wealth and cease, so these are commands, but cease from even your consideration of it. Again, the term consider there is a term in reference to 
figuring out how money works, how to get it, how to keep it, how to grow it. The writer states, you know why you're exhausted from always having to think about money? It's because you're always thinking about money. What a concept. And no matter how much you have or no matter what you attain, you will live in the perpetual state of joy-sucking weariness if your life is one in which you're constantly employing strategy to figure out how to get more of it instead of employing strategy to, quote the parable, to figure out how to give it away. So what are you living for? What are you sacrificing for? What do you stretch for? What do you go without but in order to get? There's a question that exposes loves real fast, right? What are you willing to put yourself into the place of uncomfortability for? That's what you love. In other words, what are you trusting in? Now, I know that this is not a passage that you're going to go home and do your devotions on tomorrow. But it is critical, beloved, to plant down deep into your heart. Write it on your heart. And here is why. Because apostasy and the falling away from the faith never happens overnight. How does it happen? Little by little. Every single time. And so it happens through the prospect of every new opportunity, every new thought of what could be, every new desire that dangles itself in front of your eye. And then what do you do? Well, you wake up one day and you just say to yourself, I never really believed that stuff in the first place. And you get hooked on the lie. And it drags you around the rest of your life to the pit in your apostasy. So what Paul said of Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 10, he said, now listen, for Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. Fell away. And why? He believed the lying temptation of a competing love. For having loved this present world, he has deserted me. Who is Demas? Demas was the faithful companion of the Apostle Paul who gave his life to ministry in the cause of Christ and sacrificed in tremendous ways. He's mentioned in chapter 4 of the Colossians. How do you go from sacrificing everything and being on mission with the Apostle Paul himself to then falling in love with his present world? Answer, little by little. Small compromises here, small decisions there. Resting on past faithfulness is somehow indicative of present or future faithfulness. But you cannot serve, present tense, two masters. The past doesn't matter. What are you doing today? That's the question. What's the call of the passage? Why another passage yet again on money from the instruction of our Lord? Well, because, hear this, he knows its power. He knows the allure. He understands the temptation. And so he calls us here to once again examine what it is we're loving. Some of you have unbelievably strategic minds, and you are very adept at being able to employ strategy and wisdom and cleverness, and all of that's a very good thing. Here's the exhortation. Make certain it's for the right cause. Put it toward the right cause. For some of you, that begins with the simple discipline of refusing to even let your mind go to certain places. Some of you just need to put certain thoughts and certain desires and certain plans out of your mind. And why? Well, because with time it will blossom. I promise you, it'll blossom into sin. 
And we all think we're the exception to this text. We're not. In fact, why does apathy and joylessness for the things of God begin to creep in? Well, because we have competing loves that creep in. Apathy is not a function, actually, of neutral indifference. Apathy is a function of beginning to love something else, and it's your job to figure out what it is. I just don't feel passionate about Christ. Well, what are you loving? I used to be on fire for the things of the gospel, but I just feel sort of cold. What are you loving? What do you keep entertaining? In fact, it's no wonder why John ends his first epistle this way. After speaking on the glories of Christ and seeking to bring an assurance of faith into the minds of his readers, he ends very abruptly and he says this as if out of nowhere, but he says this, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 21, he says, little children, guard yourselves from idols. Guard yourself. That is a proactive word. That is not passive. What does that mean? Well, it means don't even entertain the thought of something. Put it away. Well, you know, Pastor Paul says that nothing's to be rejected as long as it's received with thanksgiving. We're, we're free in Christ. We, we have these freedoms. Don't be a fool. And don't use the Bible to justify a passion. or a craving that could pull you away. Ask yourself and all of your thinking on whatever it is right now, how much fruit for the kingdom so far has it produced? So again, what are you living for? What do you want? What do you spend your free time strategizing about and talking about and reading about? What podcasts do you listen to to give you ideas and techniques Again, is any of that sinful? No, not necessarily, but it is telling. And the amount of time that you put into those things is the amount of time potentially that you've not produced fruit for the kingdom. And so do you want to employ the resources that God has entrusted to you for the gospel? or into the fleeting pleasures of this life that death will absolutely rob you of? What are you living for? Jesus gives to us here another sharp teaching, but to help us. Why? Because he actually loves us. He died for us. And he wants to maximize your joy. So what are you perhaps loving too much? Because you can't love God and it. And certainly if it's money, love for one pushes out love for the other. And what you're devoted to and spend the bulk of your time thinking about and sacrificing for is your master. Functionally, it is Lord and in the love of one thing is the despising of the other. Catch that. Why is it difficult to serve at times? Why does it feel like such sacrifice instead of joy? Well, because in the devotion to one thing, you begin to despise the other. It gets in the way. It is a hindering obstacle that stands in the way of what I'm craving. What is the remedy? Remedy is always the same. It is to repent. It is to begin that slow but faithful process of putting off what you ought to put off and then beginning little by little to put on what you ought to put on. And there is always grace in that. And the Lord always honors that. He really does. Next time, we'll take a look, Lord willing, at the Pharisees, who again were lovers of money, Luke says, and who scoffed at this very message. And that one is a challenging text because that one is absolutely about salvation.
and how what you love actually may be an indication of where you really stand, and especially when it's justified, as he says, and not repented of. So until then, may Christ be our desire, and may we consider our steps before him. Let's pray. Thank you.